Thanks for watching this week's sermon from Community Church. As a reminder, like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can always contribute to what we're doing at cefchurch.com slash give. Again, and uh, Doug, come on up. So this man was walking down the street and we said, hey, we need a speaker. Are you interested? And he's like, yeah, sure. I'm a car salesman, but okay. Yeah, I, I can make it up. So this is Doug McDonald, and uh, I just want to let you know that I, I love it when our pastors are gone. This sounds wrong, but I love it when they're gone because I'm like, I want Doug McDonald to speak. I want Doug. So it's my fault that you're always up here, but I'm not sorry. This is one of the most authentic, genuine, humble men that you will ever come across. So no pressure, but, uh, and he's hysterical too. So I'm I sorry change, I have to I miss this my one. my name to Rick. Okay, this is Rick. We yeah. need three? We yeah, need well, three I Ricks? Did, I want to make sure I'm in, in right, you know. <laughs> and if you're a uh, student ministry, we're, uh, let's head over to the great room. Now I know whose fault it is. John L. They gave me a clicker. I'm not going to run that. <clears throat> you will find no notes in your Bible. I mean in your bulletin. Because I have a tendency to get off of them quickly. And I thought, why should I put them in there when I'm not going to do them? You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. They made the lights really bright so I can't see you. So that means, um, just so you'll know, I'm usually not too politically correct. And if I offend you, would you forgive me now? Because if you... The thing is, you have to forgive me because you can't get to heaven until you do. But I'm just letting you know that ahead of time. Because <clears throat> there's no, no real telling what I'll say. Because um, that's why you don't have notes. Because I'm not sure. Um, I think before I start, I, I wrote down here that the first thing I should do is pray. Which I didn't do the last service until like 15 minutes in. But I needed prayer at that moment, so let's pray now. Um, would you bow your heads with me? Father, I thank you very much for this day. Lord, I thank you that we can come to, freely come to a church in America, and we can speak about you. And Lord, I don't have to worry about somebody coming in here and, and, both, and locking us in and burning the church like they are in some of these places right now. But God, you are a mighty God. And we serve you. And Lord, uh, we want to serve you. So just be um, words for me today. Speak, help me speak them. Um, let me touch hearts, Lord, through the words. And Holy Spirit, we've already invited you here. And we know that you're here in, your, in our presence, Lord. Thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Um, we prayed for each of you beforehand. Uh, so you'll know we prayed for you as you were coming to church. We prayed for you while you were arguing with your kids on your way to church. Um, we prayed for you who aren't as lucky and have argued with your spouse on your way to church. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a legacy. I'm going to show you something here. This is a, a Gibson. If you know anything about guitars, this is a, it's a gold top Les Paul. It's a 1954 model. Um, my dad bought it brand new in Burns, Oregon. He paid $200 for it. It cost $12 a month with the payments. Um, it's a super rare guitar nowadays. <clears throat> the reason I'm, gonna sh I'm showing you that because that was something that I was handed down and in a legacy sometimes st stuff is handed down that is part of a uh, you can, it can be material, it can be in a belief, it can be money. In my case, it wasn't money. Um, it could have been, and it would have been all right. Um, the reason I said that is my wife and I were watching Strange Inheritance. If you haven't watched that, I'm not really recommending it, but I'm telling you, they had a, um, they had a cello on there. It was, this cello was made in the 1700s, and uh, Stradivarius made it. 
And did, if you haven't, if you didn't see it, when, we, when I saw this, I watched it, and they, they uh, this gentleman bought it in about 1952 or 53. He paid a hundred grand for it. And uh, he was in LA. You could buy a house for $17,000. So a hundred grand on a Stradivarius is probably a little, a little, but, little much, I would have thought, but um, he had it named like something, I don't remember, some general's name or something. It was really kind of strange. But he died and he left it to his two kids. And they couldn't figure out what to do with it because now they have a Stradivarius cello and what do you do with it? So they sent it to an auction house and they, they had to make sure it was authentic. And I didn't know you could do this, but they ran an MRI on it and a CAT scan and I don't know whatever x-rays they did on it. They'd find out if it was original, if it was cracked or any of those things. And it appraised at $6.2 million. So they put it in the auction and when the auction day came around, you know, typical uh, television show, you're watching it. Well, they show it get to $6.2 million, but they don't show you what it sold for. So what was the point of getting me to that, you know? And so the guy said, the girl that was doing the interview, she said, how, um, well, can you tell me, was it, how much did it sell for, or how much more did it get? Did it, did it, did it get 25, 25% more, 50% more, you know, 100% more? What, what was the, what was the cost? And he said, well, I can't tell you, the family doesn't want it. She said, was, was it substantial? And he said, yes. And she said, well, so somewhere between the 50 and the 100, there's a, there's a price in there. I don't know, 50%. So I don't know if it sold for 12 million or, or you know, 20 million. So this one's not worth that. Um, but when I saw that, I thought, you know, it's, it's interesting that you can leave a legacy. And a legacy can be so many different things. You know, and so what I, what I wanted to do today is, uh, first I got to tell you this, this is something else I ran across. It's not really has to do with church, so don't worry. It's a shampoo warning. Well, my nephew sent it and I thought it was very good. It says, uh, we should have been told this a long time ago. I use shampoo daily in the shower and I rinse the shampoo, it runs down. On the label it says, for extra body and volume. <laughs> Did you know that works? <laughs> so you can't lose weight if you're using shampoo. <laughs> so here's what you do. So now, I'm using Dawn dish soap. <laughs> that label says, it dissolves fat, and is uh, in that, that is otherwise hard to remove. Problem solved, right? So if that happens, I'm just telling you, Dawn will work. And you should read those labels. Now when you stand up here, you can drink when you want. Um, it's kind of one of those things I learned from the pastors. You know, so I can do that. So, what I wanted to talk to you about was if you, um, Bubba, can you put that first one? Is it? I think it's this is this picture right here is a very dear picture to me. This was sent on Facebook. This is 1909 at a storefront in Bethel, Oklahoma. The lady on the left is my great grandmother. They asked, "Does anyone know this family?" And when I looked at it, I went, oh, "You got to be kidding me." I said, the little one in the middle with the funny little hair, that's my grandmother. That lady on the left, she died when she was 27 years old, 28 years old from the fever. She had seven kids. Two of them died from the fever. Her great-grandmother was, um, if you have a $20 bill on Andrew Jackson, I don't, I don't like him because he marched them from the Carolinas to Oklahoma. She was a Choctaw. There were five tribes that, met, that got resettled. Isn't it ironic that the government in their wisdom send them to Oklahoma and then find out there's oil on their land? So now they gotta buy it back because you know they gave away nothing. 
I thought. And now we got to get it back because it had oil on it. So this lady died when she was 27, 28 years old. Now she, she taught her children how to read out of the Bible. So Bubba, would you pull that next slide for me? This is my grandmother and my dad. Now that woman right there is, a, that woman is so important in my life. She, my mother was dear to me. She loved me with everything she had, but that lady right there, she was everything for me. She uh, taught, she taught us things that she probably wasn't supposed to. Um, she taught us how to fish, how to hunt. She taught my cousin and I how to drive. It's a wonder she was alive when we were done. And I am not kidding, but she was an incredible lady. And so if you'll do the next slide for me, there's my dad with this particular guitar. There I am with that guitar that he bought that was really cheap. And I'm having my first lesson. I'm only two. That's as far as the lessons went. He didn't teach anything after that. So anything that you see me playing over here, that's what I learned from guys in the church. So, I, you know, it's kind of a strange world that we live in, isn't it? And what we do, we hold dear. You know this guitar? After my dad passed away, and I would finally get a hold of his older friends or wherever they were and talk to them and what have you, they would always ask me, well, does he still have that gold top guitar? I'm like, is that the only thing you remember? This guitar has cigarette burns on it. It's played in every bar in Plumas and Lassen County and Modoc County, probably more than once. But Jim Dunn has played it for worship here a couple of times I let him. And I bet you my dad, when he bought it, never dreamed it would be held in church, played in worship songs. But it's awesome. What's next, Bubba? So this morning, and I'm going to ask Bubba a lot because when I, Ruth and I, I got off a couple of them, so that's why I didn't give you notes. This morning I'd like to focus on how we can serve the Lord and have a balanced walk with Him and affect our life forever. There are basically really four areas I'd like to touch on this morning, and that are these. Staying in the Word. Walking with the Holy Spirit. Faith. And prayer. And I mention these in this order. And I had to change a couple around for my, for Pastor Rick asked me to. But none of them are more important than the other one. You have to, ha you, you need to function in these four things all the time. You need to stay in the word. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you through. You need to have faith. And you need to pray. If we aren't paying attention to our everyday walk, it's easy to get out of balance. Sometimes it's easy to get out of balance because of this place we work. We fall in with those that are around us and we get out of, we can get out of kelter, we get out of, out of balance. When that happens, we're not able to stand for or stand before the Lord. It puts us, it, it counters out everything that we have done if we aren't walking in the will of the Lord. So we need to do everything to keep our walk in line so we can glorify him every day. Our goal as people of God should be to see that all of us, are, all of those around us would want to follow Jesus. You know, we need to not let um, one, not even one, perish for eternity in hell. That's our job, is to not let that happen. Can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to see those that have gone on before me. My grandmother, she accepted the Lord before she passed away. And I, my dad accepted the Lord. You know, I have, I was praying the other night and I was thinking about all the names of all the people that I know that have gone on before me. And I had a dear friend pass away about a month and a half ago. And every time I would see him, he would have tears in his eyes. And he was pretty old now. 
and I've known him for a long time, and he would say, I just want to see Jesus. And I thought, man, I just want to see Jesus. I want to be like that, you know. Next one, Bubba. The word, you have got to operate out of this word. You know, the word is probably, um, it's the truth. It's what you can put your life against. You can balance against it. You can see where I'm, if I'm, if I'm walking the straight and narrow or if I'm not. Um, like I said, I, I have a tendency to go all over the place sometimes, but I want to walk straight with the Lord. That's what I really want to do. Um, Timothy 3.16 and 17 says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, you cannot fight the enemy if you don't know this word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God. This is John 1.1. 1, 1. In him was life, and that life was light to all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Mark 13, 31 says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Hebrews 4, 12 says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, even dividing soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. Now, now I, want you, I want you to really pay attention to this part too. Matthew 4, 3, 11 says this, it tells us that Jesus himself, while being tempted by the devil, as soon as he, you remember he was baptized, boom, there's the enemy right there, right? And tempted by the devil and his knowledge of the word, quoting Deuteronomy and responding to the word. The enemy knows, knows believe me, the enemy has been studying this part of the word for a lot longer than you and I. He knows it really well. And do not think for a moment that, that this enemy of your soul does not know that word. He twists it every single time. He can, he'll have you confused if you're not careful because he can do it. That's what he does. He knows, by the way, he, he probably doesn't quote us the New Testament. Do you ever think about that? Um, he probably doesn't want to say, well, Jesus won, but... But he will quote the Old Testament to you, pointing to Jesus. I think that's very interesting that the enemy of our souls would even, would use the word to try to confuse us. And he does, and he's good at it. We go to the next one, there's the Holy Spirit. Walking with the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus had told us this, as he said, I have to leave. At the after the crucifixion, I have to leave. But I'm going to send you a comforter. And that comforter will be here and guide you. And that means he will be here and guide us for the rest until Jesus returns. He didn't just guide us for a couple of days. And then he's here until Jesus returns. And when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only on what he hears. And he would tell you what it is to come. That's what he's done since that day. Because those of us that are led by the Spirit of God, we are called sons of God. You know, the Lord has... Um, when, he's, when, when, when God speaks to me, um, it, it's something that I, I don't... I'm not able to tell you what he's, how he sounds to me. But when he see, speaks to me, and when the Holy Spirit uh, kind of corrects me, because sometimes I get off on a tangent or whatever, and he'll, he'll let me know that, I, that's, hey, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. You know? And I, how he does it is beyond me, but he does it. And I recognize it, which is, that's a huge thing for me, just to recognize it. But I want to go to faith next. Because I'm trying to get to the, 
the part where Rick really wanted me to talk about to you about prayer. Now, now I found this interesting because we, we quote this a lot of times in John 17, 6, and it says this, Jesus told his apostles, if you have faith no bigger than a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will obey you. Well, we quote that a lot. Um, but I don't know that if that's exactly what Jesus was saying, that we should be throwing bushes in the, in the, the stream, you know. Um, I think what he was saying is Jesus was, was not saying that faith comes in quantities. It doesn't come like in a 16-ounce bottle of ketchup or it's not a 16-ounce bottle of mustard seeds. It's faith, it, it, it's a part. It's so small. I was going to put mustard seeds on the seeds. But then I thought somebody would surely mention that to me later. Uh, yeah, I thought so. But he wouldn't have known if it was a mustard seed or not until I told him. Um, but a mustard seed grows from its tiniest seed. And it can grow up to 30 feet tall and 20 feet around. It's huge if you consider the seed. So I think what Jesus is telling us is that uh, even faith this size can accomplish much. Um, a little faith is better than no faith at all. A teeny tiny little bit of faith is better than no faith at all. In Hebrews 11:6, it says this, without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you don't, if, if you, in order, to, in order to accept the Lord, you have to have faith that he's a real God. He's alive. And by the way, he is not Muhammad. And he is not Confucius. And he's not Buddha. Those guys are dead. They haven't moved one iota since the day they died. They can pack them around all they want but our God is alive and he's well and he's here and he's wherever he needs to be. So then if we've been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know it's nice to have some peace sometimes. It's nice to have some comfort when you absolutely don't know what to do. You know, and our God gives that. We don't have to, I'm appalled at some of the stuff that people think they have to do to serve the Lord. And they serve their puny little God. You know. But our God is different because our God, Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, and when he rose, and he spent 40 days teaching again, when he did that, he ascended into heaven. And now I will tell you this. There's some people that will tell you, well, he's not really interceding for you. He's not the intercessor. He's not this and he's not that. Well, they're wrong. Scripture says, first of all, Jesus will not, as Scripture says, everyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, he's not going to shame you. You don't have to do something that will shame you. He's not that kind of God. It's really nice that the front's dark because I really don't know what they're thinking. And I'm thinking, don't give them any tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, I should have everybody move to the back. Um, I bet they've never done that in church before. <clears throat> Luke 16, 19 says this, After the Lord had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and set at the right hand of God. Now to me, that means after he spoke to them, he was taken up into heaven and set at the right hand of God. I mean, it's not. That's what it says, right? So I kind of believe it if that's what it said. Romans 8.34 says this, Jesus Christ who died and was raised to life and is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. To me, that means he's interceding for us. Hebrews 7.25 says this, there is one God, one mediator between God and man. And that's the man, Jesus Christ. That means he's the guy. Hebrews 4 throws all that old stuff out. 
and says this. Therefore, since we have a high priest who has gone through the heavens, it's Jesus, the Son of God. We don't have to do all the old things where we have to do a sacrifice and do all those things because our guy's already there. He did the sacrifice. You know, we win. I think the enemy does not read that part. It's true. Would you read that part if it was you? <laughs> so, so what I've done is I saved prayer for last. So I want to go to prayer, Bubba. And I save this because I want to spend a little bit more time on it. Because it's one of our building blocks that we're doing. And pastor asked me to share some things about prayer too. So I knew it was the building block and I was going to share on it. But when pastor asked me about it, then I thought, well, maybe I should do that too. <clears throat> um, he asked me to share some things that I've, that, that I've experienced. Now, when I teach or preach, it's interesting because I only teach or preach stuff that I been through and I know and it's happened to me I can, I'm not really good at taking um, taking one one section and using that and preach out of it I can do it but I, but I'm better if, if I can just if I if I just go with what I know and what I feel um, and I've asked the Lord to make sure and keep me on the right track while I'm doing it so I my faith is that he keeps me on the right track while I'm doing this so I don't confuse everyone Um, and as I said, these four things are, are intertwined together and linked together, you know, so close that you can't operate without one or the other, whether it's faith, whether it's prayer, whether it's the Holy Spirit, or whether it's the Word. It has to all operate together. If it doesn't operate together, that's how we get out of balance. I find interesting that Timothy says this, I urge then... First of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And then he lists this, which I wasn't really happy about. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Well, some of those kings and some of those in authority, I wasn't sure about. But God said, let's pray for them. So maybe we should pray for them. Because you know what? I think they need it worse than some of us. Some of the stuff that they're going through has got to be tough. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your quest to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I, I, I can't tell you um, how much the comfort can come in when it's hard, when you don't know what to do. So I'm gonna ask Bubba to do this next slide. And I'm gonna introduce you to a lady um, that became part of my life in September of 1973. So that's 46 years ago. Um, she allowed me to marry her and uh, she has poured more into my life than anything that I've, anything. She's my, she's my kind of my rock. She's the, she tells me when I'm doing something wrong, which she shouldn't, but she does. And she points things out to me on occasion, which I'm, I say I wasn't doing that, but she probably is right. Um, but anyway, uh, she was, She's been so important to my life. Um, she got saved before I did. And uh, she didn't hound me to go to church. She, um, by the way, I had good hair, didn't I? <laughs> um, just saying. Um, you know, she didn't hound me to do those things. <clears throat> when she quit hounding me is when I decided I better go to church. You know, and uh, went there with her and dedicated my life to the Lord. Um, but here's what happened, and this is what Pastor kind of wanted me to share. Now, in 1994, uh, my wife was diagnosed with lupus. Now, I had never heard of lupus. 
and didn't realize how devastating um, that that disease can really be. Um, my wife is like, uh, um, she's like MacGyver. You know, she can do anything. If you gave her, you know, you can give her a stick and a piece of string and she can have a garden. You know, I mean, I don't know how she does it, but she does it. So people that come over to my house, they say, oh, Doug, you've done such a wonderful job with the front yard and the backyard. It's so beautiful. I always say, yeah, I was, it was hard work, <laughs> really hard work. I had to watch her mow. Um, because, not because I don't want to mow, I've learned that if she mows, it's okay. If I mow, it's not right. See, I mow like this, maybe, and she mows like, it looks like the A's infield. It goes like that, you know, and I'm like, wow, how do you do that? And she, it always looks really nice. You know, she'll be mowing in the middle of a snowstorm if she needed to. Um, she might need to because I think spring and summer are over. We're almost back to winter. Um, I just noticed that when we come in and it's still snowing. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is Lassen County. Thank you, Lord. Um, but she is an incredible lady. She, she is artistic. She does, I mean, she, she loves to take wedding dresses apart and put them back together and build them and make them and do prom dresses and stuff like that. And uh, she does an incredible job. She was sewing beads on a dress like these tiny little things and she must have put a couple hundred of them on there. And you know, I would have glued them puppies on there and they had been done. Um, but this, this lupus thing was a, was a bad thing. Um, I didn't know it. So it was starting to affect her kidneys, which is what it's supposed to do. And in, it started in July of 2003, our first granddaughter was born, Gage. I could have her stand up. Should I have you stand up, Gage? Stand up, Gage. That's my granddaughter. Yeah. Sit down, Gage. You're taking too much, you're taking too much. Sit down. Um, so anyway, um, she was just born, three months old. Well, but, but my, the first time my wife had to have this infusion done. And what we were trying to do is kill the immune system in order to, the immune system wouldn't kill the kidneys and then supposedly it will build back up and then you can get back somehow to normal. And what they do is they do an infusion on this date and then they drop you down, your, your immune goes down, immune system goes down, then they come back up, then it goes down there and it comes back up and it goes down there and that's 30 day intervals. Well, well when it got to here, there was a problem. Um, I noticed after the second one that she, she wasn't, her motor skills were changing and some things were changing. So, so I, know, I knew there was a problem, but I, I didn't know how to do anything. You know, so we would go, the doctors go back and forth and back and forth and my kids would come over and watch help on weekends so I could work and we had our own business and I was trying to do that. I was trying to, trying to do both and uh, her sister would come up and stay with her, you know, so I could work for that week and, and it just didn't get better. And we went into, on, a, on Halloween of 2003, um, her sister had come up to let one of my daughters go back to Reno. All three of them had lived in Reno. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. It was, really, it was re getting really bad. I was feeding her at the time because she couldn't hold the instruments. Um, and it, it just, it, it seemed like everything was going downhill. And uh, it, was, it, it got to the point that, I mean, I was praying, but I was, pr I was praying. I was, I was doing what I thought I knew how to could do. And it got to the point that um, I had to sit down with her one night. Now, as a husband, um, everything that I knew was out of my control. And so... All I could do was pray. And pray is a little word still for me at that point. And it was one night and she was lying there in the bed. And I was sitting beside of it. 
And I said, uh, <clears throat> I said, uh, Marcia, I have to let you go. I'm going to give you to the Lord because I can't do anything and I don't know what to do. And um, I said, I asked the Lord to take care of her and I don't know if she understood me or heard me at that point because what was happening is an infection had started which they told us when you get to that point, see if there's anything in you that could be infec an infection, it will take off. And it did. batteries left so so there's nothing I could do but I gave her to the Lord and uh, I never dreamed in my life I would have to give her away didn't cross my mind that you would have to give someone away that you love and uh, I had to give her away to the Lord and uh, I knew what had happened is she, she had an infection and it started in her brain. And so they were doing multitudes of blood tests and everything you can think of and they weren't finding anything. And what happens, and for those of you that are in the, the medical world, not me, um, I didn't realize there was a, I, I know now, there's a, a brain barrier in the blood. And the blood that goes inside into the brain and the blood that's outside on the skull are two different, are cleansed by two different valves in the heart. And uh, so doing all those blood tests, everything would come up normal. But, so they had to do a biopsy on her brain and they did that. And that was a whole nother story, but I won't tell you because that was a really frustrating day for her. And, uh, but they, they did them and they, and they sent biopsies to Stanford and they sent it down to Davis and down into San Francisco. And nothing came back. They told us you'll have a, you'll have a, they'll know in 24 hours. They'll know in 48 hours because they never ever get it wrong. Well, they, it never ever came back with what it was. And what was happening is there were these lesions developing on her brain. And you could see them in the, in the CT scan and you could see them in the MRI. But you couldn't, they couldn't figure out what, what, what they were. And so they, by this point, she is in the hospital. And she is not conscious, she's semi-conscious. For some reason, she can kind of respond back and forth to me and the kids. But she doesn't respond back to a lot of other people. And I think she recognizes our voice and... She had dates confused, and uh, it looked like maybe she had had a stroke because uh, there ended up being some blood clots in her arm. Her arm had swollen pretty good size, and, and there were feeding tubes and all kinds of stuff going on. And they started antibiotics, and the nurses in the ICU told me, Doug, this isn't going to work because she's on too many of them. And she was at one at one point in a 24-hour period, she was taking 11 different antibiotics. And they said, when you do this, it doesn't work. You don't get, you don't recover from this, the way we're doing this. And so we were being prepared to 
um, come home. Uh, not really knowing if she was going to live or if she was going to be in a wheelchair or what was going to happen. And so we prepared that a little bit at home. And I could not figure out what to do. Now I was in prayer. Uh, the church was praying. Um, you know, so, so we sat one, one, one night. I was worshiping the Lord at home and I was down and I was just, I was just praying. I said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. How can you give me this person and then how, what can I do? And he said, you know what to do. And you know when I said, you'll recognize the voice? You recognize the voice because you just, you just do. And I said, I said, I don't know what to do, Lord. And he said, yes, you do. So I sat up and I, and I, I got my Bible and I opened it and I opened it to this and is any among you in trouble let them pray is anyone happy let them sing songs of praise James 5 13 through 15 is anyone among you sick let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make that sick person well and the Lord will raise them up so I got up from where I was it was late at night I had three daughters living in Reno and I called them and I said here's what we're going to do Sunday morning at 10:30, we're going to pray as a group and I'm going to call her brother who was an elder in a church in Alturas and I was an elder at the church at the Assembly of God and I said, we're going to anoint her with oil and pray. So you guys, you're going to have to be there. And they, they said, okay, no problem. That's what we'll do. I said, we have a plan. I got a plan. This is the plan. Um, and Pastor Rust, I don't know if any of you ever knew him. To me, probably um, awesome man to me. Um, I don't know how he was to everybody else, but he, he would call me on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and he would say, what do you need today? What do you need now? And I would tell him and they would pray for whatever it was um, at that point. So I told him, I said, Pastor, I need some help. Um, I'm going to pray at 1030 in the morning. I'm going to anoint her with oil and I need your help. He said, what do you want me to do? I said, you just tell me what can you do? And he said, we'll stop our service. We'll pray at 1030. I said, that's all I want. So then in this following five days, he said, do you mind if I call some other pastors that I know? I said, I, I don't mind at all. And uh, this is how the enemy works. <laughs> it's just, the enemy is good. He's really good at this stuff. So the prayer was supposed to happen at 10.30 in the morning. So the doctor came in and said, we're going to do an MRI at 10.30. I said, well, we're not going to do one at 10.30. I said, you've already done them every single day, two, three times a day. There's no sense in us running down there at 10.30. I said, we can do one after 10.30. He said, well, that's what time we have it scheduled. I said, well, we can just reschedule it. It's not a big deal, you know. And he said, okay. So at 1030 in Reading, Mercy Hospital, I had nurses tell me, um, this isn't going to work, you know, st all the things they were doing. Well, here was what was going to happen. This is, was about to be a witness to doctors nurses, our family, friends, and to all the church who stopped and prayed with us. There were over 20 churches that did that. Our ch my daughters had church in Reno. They stopped theirs. There was one in Texas. There was one in Oregon. It, there was one in Massachusetts. I didn't care where they were. I didn't care if they were Jehovah's Witnesses. Sorry. 
I told you I'm not 100% politically correct, but I'm just telling you. I don't care who they were. If they wanted to pray in the name of Jesus, I don't care. Pray. You know? So, I, I got down there with her brother. We had our anointing oil. We had a plan. We were going to go in and pray. They let two people in to the ICU. And so he and I are going in there. The rest of them are going to pray out in the waiting room. So, fortunately, as God knows, I had a traveling nurse. And he was, uh, he was a really nice one, good one. And I said to him, I asked my daughter, I said, uh, Carissa, how many people are out there in the, in the waiting room? She said, I don't know, Dad, there's like six or eight or ten, something like that, six. I said, I thought, well, if I could get my three daughters in here, that would help. So I asked this nurse, I said, can I bring anybody else in? And he said, uh, how many? I said, I don't know. Three, six, I don't know, maybe eight. He said, uh, if the lady next door says that it's okay, because none of the rest of them were having a problem. My wife couldn't even talk. You know, I'm like, how can you get shot, not have a problem over here, and here she can't move? And I'm thinking, Lord, what's going on here, you know? And so I asked. And, he's, and I said, can I bring him in? And he said, yeah. Did you know you can fit over 20 people in an ICU room? <laughs> Did you know that? You can. I was amazed. But I had a problem. Because they came in. There was people everywhere in there. And I was trying not to get the nurse in trouble. Um, I didn't want, you know, like, it, it would be look bad if they hauled us out into jail because we were in too many in the ICU. Um, so anyway, I said, um, I started to pray. And here's what happened. I couldn't pray. Oh my gosh. The emotion was unbelievable. It was huge. And I started. And I couldn't do it. I could say a couple of words. And I couldn't do it. And I tried, and my daughter stepped up and started praying. And she broke down, and my son-in-law started praying. He took over and praying. You know, he was an ex-Mormon. I'm like, wow, that's cool. But I couldn't do it. And she started praying, and her sister was in there with us. She had several of them in there. She has five sisters, so they, you know, you never, I don't remember which ones were there. But her hand had swollen so bad that her fingers wouldn't move. And when we finished praying, she was moving these two little fingers like this, you know. And I saw it quickly, and my, sis, my sister-in-law saw it, and she said, Doug, did you see that? And I said, yeah, I did. And it started moving her fingers. And they, so they, so I had to get 20 people out of the room because, you know, you don't want to get the guy fired. And, and sh they said, we have to, we have a, now we have a MRI schedule for like 1130. I'm like, go ahead. We're, I'm there. And we went and we had this MRI done. And uh, I was sitting in the room and the neurologist came and got me and he said, Doug, come look at this. And he had the, all the things up on the wall, you know. I'm pretending I'm like a doctor. Yeah, I see that. I know that. Um, anyway, he said, I don't know about these lesions. They're vaporizing. I said, well, imagine that. I said, he said, what we're doing must be working. I said, well, what you're doing hasn't worked for 30 days. So maybe what we're doing is helping. And he said, I said, we just prayed in there for... I didn't tell him we had 20 people in there. <coughs> I was thinking, you know, there's sometimes you've got to be quiet. And I said, we just prayed. And, and we prayed. That's what we did. He goes, well, whatever you think. I said, you said they're vaporizing. That's what we prayed for. That stuff's gone. You know? And they were vaporizing. They were absolutely disappearing. Unbelievable. The Lord is so incredible. So the end of this story is this. So I had to come home on a Monday. And I get home. 
and my sister-in-law, before I got home on Monday, this was Sunday we prayed, on Monday, my wife is in a room. This is really, she's, she's pretty determined also. Um, she's got a can of insurer like this, you know, and she's got the phone that's on the desk like this, you know, I'm like, what are you doing? Put that stuff down, you know, and, and so I come home, and my sister-in-law calls me on Wednesday, Doug, you're not going to believe this, she's in a wheelchair, and she's going to the rehab center, I said, she couldn't get out of the bed, what are you talking about? She said, well, she can now. She's in the wheelchair. And I said, but she can't get out of the wheelchair. We have to be there. And she goes, I know, but she's in the wheelchair. And she sa I said, where's she at? She's in the van already. She won't get out. She's ready to go. <laughs> so, okay, I'm coming back down. So I come down to the rehab center in Reading. And if, if you haven't been out there, it's on 299, one left. And I took her to it because it was a lot bigger when we were in there than it is when you go look at it. And... Uh, She has a wheelchair. Now she's racing old people <laughs> around the center at the rehab hospital. Unbelievable. Then the next thing you know, she's playing horseshoes in there. Yeah, we couldn't do nothing about it. Um, the crazy thing is, we haven't really been able to slow her down either. Um, but but we, we had to do a lot of stuff and we had to grow a lot. I had to grow a lot. I had to do a lot of stuff that I never dreamed I would have to do. So, about, was it a day before Thanksgiving? We went down there, and then, guess what? My daughter ordered this Thanksgiving dinner from Marie Callender's. Incredible. Guess what? My wife said, we can't eat that. We have to eat what they're eating here in the hospital. We're like, why? That stuff looks good. You know, well, the stuff they served us, I'm going to tell you, if it was turkey, it was turkey a really long time ago. <laughs> and if you put enough turkey in the juicer and freeze it, I guess it's turkey. But I don't really know. And we got home two days before Christmas. Now you got to know this about my wife. If you, um, if you ever saw her Christmas tree, it might as well be in one of those magazines. Um, did you say that, Linda? Okay. Um, so my daughters and my son-in-laws had got the Christmas tree and they had it all decorated and it was all ready to go. And we had a wonderful Christmas. That was incredible what the Lord can do. So here's my, my ending to my story. We just went down last week. The lupus, it's, in, it's under control. You know, if they gave her, we prayed. We prayed. I wanted her to have enough days to see her grandchildren. She's seen all. We have six of them. She, she, sees, she knows them. She's seen them. She takes care of them. She chases them. Um, but I didn't know how much time the Lord has given her. And it doesn't really matter. Whatever he's given her is good for me. And it's good for us. So I don't want my legacy to be something material. As a guitar. Or as a classic car that I've done. Or any of that. What I want my legacy to be. Is that if you see me. Please see Jesus in me. Because I don't want. I want to see Jesus. And so. I want you to be Jesus. We need to be that folks. He's got to be able. They got to be able to see that in us. Or we can't touch anything. You know we, we can't do it. But if he can see if people can see Jesus in us, I want them to see Jesus in me when I die. I want my kids and my grandkids to know the Lord. I want them to know him so that they're there. Because I'm going there and I'm, I've got people I've got to see. And I can't wait to see him. But I want them with me. 
And so I need them to see Jesus in me. And I need you to see Jesus in each other. I'm going to play a song. It's uh, the last one on there, Baba. And I want you folks to listen to this song and pay attention to the words. And I'll come back here in a second. Um, if you would stand with me. <clears throat> I'm sorry that I kept you this long. But believe me, you got a different sermon than the first service got. Father, we, uh, we love you today. Lord, you are an incredible God that would love us the same. I don't even know why you love us sometimes, Lord. I see the stuff we do. I don't know it's not right. But God, help us through it. Holy Spirit, guide us, direct us. Let us, let us know your words so we know exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And Lord Jesus, come quickly. Thank you. Be with each as they go today. Bless them this week. Let them find favor on them at, the, at their jobs, Lord. At whatever they're doing, let, let favor just pour it out on them. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.